Well, again, welcome back. Uh, like I said, we're on, uh, we just turned uh, base leg final approach uh, for the uh, MHS uh, track here. And again, appreciate every, every, everybody's uh, participation to date. Uh, again, there's been a theme this entire uh, session, and that's all mapping back uh, to Dr. Woodson's uh, and the MHS's strategic vision and the uh, various li uh, lanes, as I call it, or, or lines of effort. And so one of these is, uh, you know, more global health engagement and, and strategic partnerships. So we have assembled, again, uh, what I call a very uh, talented core uh, as we shape through policy and then through uh, kind of what I call uh, modeling. In other words, uh, you know, what kind of bang for the buck are we getting for our global health engagement? Uh, and, and, and again, it's going to feed off of what we had uh, from the Joint Staff. It's, uh, as you said, every brief we've had maps back to somebody else's brief, but then maps back to the MHS uh, strategic vision. And again, that's uh, precisely uh, the way it was designed. So uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce Dr. David Smith, and uh, many of you all know him, him as the former Joint Staff Surgeon. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and he spent a glorious year sabbatical in Afghanistan, so he has lived and breathed global health engagement to a level that most uh, will never experience. So uh, Dr. Smith, uh, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rob, um, and uh, good morning, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about global health engagement. And as uh, Dr. Rob already pointed out, uh, this is one of the uh, lines of effort that is being emphasized by the um, uh, military health system. And clearly, hopefully, through the course of this day or session, uh, you'll be able to, uh, if you don't already know why it's so important to uh, our future, uh, hopefully you will come away with that. So with that, um, so it's global health engagement, smart power in defense. And before I get started, I guess I have to put up this slide. No one has anything to disclose, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so we have no disclosures, so we'll move on to the business. Um, and as, uh, as I said, and as Dr. Woodson has said, um, this isn't in the category of nice things to do. This is in the category of things that we must do. And I will argue that this is um, one of the most important tools that the DOD has for cultivating partnerships, for uh, working on stability, and preventing the next conflict by making sure that we are uh, 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 well ensconced in global health engagement. So uh, the first thing, and what we're going to be talking to you about is um, uh, a global health working group that we set up because we knew that there were a number of different issues about um, uh, expanding global health engagement and we wanted to do it right. So one of the first things that the team did was, well, what does global health engagement even mean? We, there was no doctrinal definition. Uh, so uh, the group set out to and developed the doctrinal definition and this is what it is. The DOD Global health engagement comprises health and medically related actions and programs undertaken by us, obviously, since it's our definition, to improve foreign armed forces, which is the principal work that's done, but there's a fair amount of work that's also done with foreign civil authorities to increase capacity, to promote and strengthen human and or animal health systems in support of national security objectives. So one of the areas that differentiates the work that we do within um, the DOD is the fact that we're always looking at it through the national security lens, and there ought to be a link back to whatever we're doing based on that national security uh, requirement. But that's actually a pretty easy link when you think about and look at some of the things that are going on around the world, and I think Ebola is a great, a great example of that, and the potential impact and the fact that things like infectious diseases and other health issues don't necessarily um, respect borders and sort of our traditional um, ideas of uh, security. So that's the definition, and so that's what we're uh, working towards. And it can be very broad. I, I, I define it incredibly broad. When we're doing um, interoperability work with our partners in NATO or in other militaries, that's clearly global health engagement and building our capacity and their capacity knowing more about each other, as is when we're uh, doing direct work in a uh, in um, uh, in 
Liberia, for example, um, with, uh, uh, with uh, the civilian population. So, and this is all about uh, a concept that was uh, brought together over the last decade or so called smart power. And clearly DOD is well known for its hard power, if you will. The big stick piece of our diplomacy is clearly carried out primarily by DOD. Uh, but there's the soft power piece of it, um, the, the sort of non-kinetic trying to avoid needing to use the big stick and using the carrots and the other uh, means of government to influence. And as was uh, nicely put together, if you put both soft power and hard power together, then you end up with smart power and a great way to exercise and use in a diplomatic and uh, influential way for the uh, uh, for the good of the USG, and we would argue, of course, for the world, um, um, uh, these various tools. But they can, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it can be very diverse and complex. And uh, this just is sort of a compilation of all those things. But as we look across the defense enterprise through this lens, we see, as I had said, an incredible diversity and complex set of tools uh, that support that soft piece of the smart power. And we have the unique ability to use the profession and the tools that are inherently used for positive outcomes for people around the globe. And health is really the great leveler. And if you think about it, it crosses all the artificial boundaries. No matter where you are in the world, the ability to deliver quality health well defines people and societies and legitimacy in, in governments um, around the world. And we, when we bring the tool of health to the defense engagement, we bring goodwill of the American people and, and all of those that are engaged, partners and um, any uh, government that's engaged in it, the skill and expertise of our military health system reaching to the highest levels of the government. So with that, we are distributed around the world. And this next slide will show you that. And so here we have um, our engagement. This is uh, based over an 18-month period. And the numbers, which you may not be able to read, but you'll see are in most of those countries, are represent theater security cooperation plans that have been done by the COCOMs that have a significant or are principally health-related engagements. And in, uh, in the work that uh, Glenn Deal and others have been doing, looking at all of that work that's being done in, uh, for security cooperation, it turns out that over half of those engagements by the COCOMs include a substantial health component. And so that's what the numbers are. And then we have a number of enterprises that actively engage. One is the Glo Global Emerging Infectious uh, Surveillance, or GEIS group, based out of the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center that funds our laboratory networks for, to do outreach work uh, to improve surveillance capabilities of our partners to include, uh, and to improve our bio surveillance um, and understanding around the world. And we have an obvious need just for force health protection of people going forward, but there's also a clear need for the world to know about hot spots and things that are popping up unique uh, uh, pathogens that have come onto the scene. And so the yellow and the orange represent the distribution of where GEIS has active programs in the last 18 months in their budget. And then the other uh, unique uh, program that we've got is the Defense HIV AIDS program, or DHAP, which is part of the PEPFAR program, about half funded by PEPFAR and about half funded by uh, uh, the DHP that was specifically set up because um, it was seen in the AIDS epidemic, there was a devastating effect on personnel, not only in uh, the civilian community, but also in the mil militaries around the world. And it was uh, really beginning to destabilize some of those important entities that are part of a government. And so it was recognized that we needed a specific program that was oriented directly to the military, and it made sense that the military were the ones that actually ran that. And so there, uh, we have the, a very highly successful DHAP program that has over 500,000 interactions uh, with patients on an annual basis and are in 80 different countries, and those are represented by the orange and the purple. 
So clearly, it's a very global enterprise um, that we're, we're involved in. Dave, before you leave sure. that slide, can, you, um, can we have, I know we have several COCOMs. Uh, COCOM surgeons in the room. Can you stand up, introduce yourself, uh, since you, uh, he's actually calling you out on this slide. So. Right, I'm, I'm Colin Chin, a U.S. Pacific Command Surgeon. Did you want me to comment on the slide? Well, I, yeah, maybe. We, Why not? Yeah, we got time too. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, so actually, I would this say this is the last break. We can go till one, two o'clock. Right. Um, actually, and I, I know this is based on on funding, and so the numbers you, uh, would you have there, but in terms of the actual engagements that are health related in the PACOM AOR in the past year, it's about 118. Why are different? You know, just for one of the six geographic co -cops. Right, on the so. 18. So I understand this is just numbers based right. on the data you have from funding per, uh, perspective, but with our, our components that they do, as well as uh, my office at, at PACOM, I, I would, when I, if I, I would have a slide, I would have 118 or more engagements. Which is, oh, thanks for that clarification. That's a really valuable point, because this is based on the, uh, the funding streams that we, that we see. So. Yeah, Rudy Catchwala, the command surgeon, U.S. Southern Command. As, as far as uh, health engagement in the South Korea OR, I'll put a dollar figure on it. Um, in 15, we're executing about $3 million worth of health engagements, not including what Ma Navy is putting against continuing, continuing promise. So it's a significant amount. And since I do have the microphone, um, I will just kind of make one comment, which is, you know, global health engagement is not a J-metal task to the COCOMs. I mean, if you look, you've got patient move, you've got some clinical ops, plans and ops, logistics. Bottom line is, is at the COCOM level, we're doing global health engagement out of pocket. Okay, so one of the things I, I, I put out to the working group here is, what should the resourcing model look like for the COCOMs as far as global health engagement? Should it be an actual J-metal task? Should it be re resourced against it? and also the role potentially of health attaches. And that's, uh, both of those are great points that we'll put on the, uh, on the list. We have been actively working the health attache uh, question in the interagency and, and working out models for that and what does that actually mean. Um, and uh, relative to the funding, that incredible tricky issues associated with that. And we're even hoping this, um, next set of appropriations have some loosening of some of the restrictions on that, but uh, great points that we'll uh, uh, take in. And now we've got AFRICOM. Hello, I'm Dave Weiss, I'm AFRICOM surgeon. You see there's a lot of medical related activities in Africa. There's obviously a big need there for those type of activities. DHAP is a big player. Uh, you know, they get 8% of the total, um, you know, HIV funding for military programs, so that's very helpful. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, USAM UK, which is U.S. Army uh, Medical Research Unit in Kenya, which also does a lot of activity research in the, the Eastern Africa, and we're also uh, blessed with NAMU-3 up in Egypt to do a lot of activity on the continent as well for surveillance activity. So, and we're just now beginning, be getting better at partnering with DITRA, who is actually pretty well suited and funded to help with virus surveillance in the future. So we, we look forward to that, those activities. And thank you. And I, I neglected to mention we have six overseas labs, which really are the sort of front outposts for the whole USG for the biosurveillance efforts. Um, there's one also in Peru. Uh, David mentioned Cairo and Kenya. We have one in Tbilisi, Georgia. And then there, is, um, there are two in PACOM, one in Bangkok and um, one in uh, Singapore. And they have a number of sort of branch uh, locations also. So they cover those areas regionally. Um, so, and then we have UCOM. Yes, sir. So John Mitchell, and uh, so we've got about 46 projects that are not shown on that map, 10 of which are of interest to POTUS, SECDEF, a non-medical DASD, uh, or U.S. ambassadors. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, $1.5 million. And uh, I will also say on an in there was an independent study done by the Kaiser Foundation on our global health engagement efforts overall. And when they count the DITRAs and uh, what we do and the various components uh, and the COCOMs, it, uh, the figure they came up on an annual basis is, is it's about $656 million a year is put into the global health engagement enterprise. So it's not an insignificant uh, uh, investment. So we're everywhere. And basically, we do it through three different areas. 
Uh, we've already talked about most of these, and I'll illustrate a few examples. Um, certainly, stability ops, we tend to think of those as uh, what we've been doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and areas of conflict. Um, cooperation, we talked about the theater security cooperation. This is where we go in and do mutually uh, beneficial kinds of uh, exercises with uh, partners around the world. Often medical, as I said, will be a door opener that um, uh, other parts of the uh, military have trouble going in there because they're the military, but as we said, health is the great lever leveler. And all of them involve capacity building. And um, we have been trying to shift and move the whole global, all of our global health engagement to not be direct care kinds of um, situations unless we're doing that alongside and with our partners face forward um, uh, building capacity for them to be doing the same sort of work when we're not there and for sustainability purposes. So just to give a few examples and actually the four guys that just talked can do this a lot better than I can but uh, an example in the stability in the upper left hand corner this is uh, actually the work that's going on in Afghanistan to build the, the medevac capability, an inherent medevac capability for the Afghans because they have realized that uh, it is needed just like we've known for a long time to know that if I'm going to get injured that I'm going to be cared for and there's a way for me to get cared for. And um, they attribute a lot of this work to decreasing the desertion, the des desertion rates of the um, uh, of the uh, Afghan National Army uh, folks. And then down in the uh, lower right hand corner is a subject matter um, expert exchange um, that has been going on in Thailand and they use that capability in the, uh, in the flooding that occurred um, in Bangkok in 2011, just as an example after we had done that training. And then cooperation, um, AFRICOM has had a uh, uh, extensive program to train disaster and pandemic uh, preparedness across uh, Africa. I think they have 19 countries engaged in that. Um, uh, in the lower right hand corner is where Nigeria was actually uh, announcing its, uh, its multi-sectorial across the various parts of the government plan um, last fall that uh, Dr. Woodson and I had a privilege to attend. And, you see the uh, deputy commander of AFRICOM um, standing next to the woman in pink who's the charge at the embassy. And we all think that that work probably had some effect in the um, Ebola outbreak that they had in Lagos that really had the potential to be an absolute nightmare in one of the biggest cities in the world uh, because they were able to invoke um, uh, relatively quickly their emergency response. This one um, is part of an uh, exercise that's done annually in um, Mongolia. And I think the, the name is great, it's Khan Quest. Um, and this is a multilateral exercise with subject matter uh, uh, exchange. And here we've got a Mongolian soldier um, treating a US Marine as part of uh, the uh, combat drill in, in uh, Khan Quest. Another example, this is um, in Laos, I believe, where um, uh, we were having a subject matter exchange in an ICU that had been built by the United States and now going back and helping with the capacity building uh, for that work um, in an area that actually had been um, uh, one of the targets of the bombing during the Vietnam War uh, period in, uh, in uh, Laos. And then uh, we can't forget that a very important part of uh, global health security is the, uh, the nexus between animals and humans and the one health approach of the global health security agenda. And so this is a, a, another example from Mongolia of where we've got, and this is um, Major Doug Riley, a veterinarian who is uh, actually working with his counterpart, on, uh, a Mongolian veterinarian to uh, improve husbandry and, and health of the animals. And as many of you know that have been involved in this work, often the animals are such critical economic engines for the families that uh, you frequently wonder if there's more value in the animal than there may be in some of the uh, uh, 
the members of the family, but uh, another very important part of uh, animal health exchange. So those are just some examples of the work. So now to get into the uh, Global Health uh, Working Group uh, uh, strategy and work, we had a number of building blocks that already exist relative to global health, but I think it was also recognized by the community that there were three target areas that we needed to spend a fair amount of work on further developing and um, trying to um, uh, figure out uh, solutions to improve this, uh, this uh, area of uh, pursuit. And so there are three of them that um, I, I have the real subject matter experts, the chairs of the committees, to uh, talk through. And one is the provision of care. And this is all of the uh, sticky issues related to, and ethical issues and, and other issues related to uh, the provision of care in environments that are different than where we've been trained. So this is, this is taking first world providers and throwing them into third world environments and making sure that the kind of training that we're doing is actually sustainable training and training that will actually last in the uh, communities and isn't doing, uh, at times, um, additional harm because we're training them on things that, that aren't sustainable or usable in the future. And so uh, this committee has gone and looked at those issues and um, a number of others that are related to uh, provision of care. Another one was, I already talked about we spend a lot of money in this area and we do a lot of work in this area. How do we know that it's having a net positive effect and which of the interventions that we do actually have the greatest effect uh, relative to our national security strategy? Um, so uh, we'll talk through that and the work that uh, uh, Captain Deal and his team is doing on that. And then third one is we've been doing this global health engagement for a fair period of time, what is our training pipeline in our uh, making sure that everybody understands all the basics and the understanding rather than just on the job training by telling me, Doc, go out and do good things uh, from the line commander. And what should the line be learning about global health engagement so that we can um, uh, make sure that they understand what a valuable tool this is in their, uh, in their toolbox. So, uh, let's see, I think I've already sort of gone through this. This is what I hopefully just said in uh, words on the slide. And then we have a timeline, and these are, can be very difficult and hard um, discussions that require a fair amount of research, work, and commitment by the teams. And so we've been wor we started this in, um, the third quarter of 13, and we expect to have their product um, this spring. Right, guys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and and it, it's actually uh, well on, on track to do that, but uh, uh, that just gives you an idea of the work. So with that, I think we're going to start with uh, uh, Captain Deal, um, and then we will uh, progress through uh, it's Colonel Hemingway next, and then uh, Colonel Chambers will uh, be the uh, cleanup for the rest of us. Thanks. So, Captain Deal. Thank you. Now, I am not uh, technically proficient, so uh, migrating to the next slide deck may be. It's the up and down. Oh, okay. Up. Oh, now you're. Step away. Ah, wow, that's. Isn't that impressive? That is impressive. <laughs> so down uh, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, General Rob, Desi Smith, uh, Flag and General Officers, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, combatant Command Surgeons, certainly a great opportunity for uh, the MOE committee to present this morning. Um, and I, I do have to mention, uh, my co-chair on the committee is uh, Commander Rich Gustafson, but he's fairly tied up with the DOD Ebola response right now. He would have liked to have been here today as well, but uh, uh, due to that um, uh, co commitment could not be here. And I also have to just state up front that unfortunately I have to step away. Um, I will not be here for the panel discussion. Um, one of my other hats is as a director of the Navy Global Health Engagement Program, and we have an engagement, uh, Vice Admiral Nathan has an engagement uh, that begins at noon. Uh, so I will be <laughs> quickly leaving uh, here and going out to DHHQ immediately following my comments today. So. If you do have uh, comments uh, 
uh, please save them. I, I can get them. I'm sure my, my colleagues will, will very happily make sure that uh, I can, uh, can review and get back to every one of you if you have any comments or recommendations or suggestions, and I'm, I'm very open to that. We'll take the arrows for you. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Smith. So the, for, for the MOE committee, we were tasked with two things. Uh, one, the establishment of a process, and the other, the establishment of a learning tool. And, and part of this came out of the NDA 2013 Section 715 language. Somewhat amorphous if you read the language, so we had a lot of stuff that's written, and I, I'm a for, former uh, Navy legislative liaison, so sometimes when our, our friends on the Hill give us language, Sometimes it's a bit uh, uh, ambiguous, uh, and that's by intent. Uh, so we, we had these things in the language we knew that we had to do something with. Uh, and then we also, of course, had the opportunity with the Global Health Work Group. Um, so again, process and learning tool. And what they might mean to you uh, may be a little bit different than uh, what they meant to our committee, but I'm very proud of the work that our committee has done. And just to speak to that, um, our committee is composed of across all the services. Uh, I have a, a few from the combatant commands that are also uh, participate actively in our committee. Um, some from the joint staff um, across all, again, all services, Air National Guard, uh, some civilians, and some in the interagency that also uh, contribute to what we're trying to what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so here is our timeline, and I just on this slide I just highlight the top, which is this. No standardized, uh, I guess my pointer, st no standardized process. Uh, there's incompatible data resources out there, sources, and then uh, where are we gonna focus? Uh, because when you ask a question on are we making an impact or are we measuring the right things, it largely depends on where you sit. Uh, like Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics are local. Well, the same thing some, somewhat for, for MOE, because if you, it depends. Who is asking the questions? The combatant commander asking the question is, does my security cooperation make a difference in more favorably predisposing another nation to like us more, i.e. smart power? Or am I looking at establishing an organic capability, aeromedical evacuation in, in, a, in a nation, giving them something that they didn't have before, and now they have? That's also fantastic work. And so, again, you have to look at who is asking the question and then what your intended response is. Okay, so my background is in economics, so this is the proverbial supply and demand. Uh, so the requirements on the left side, uh, we understand, and uh, of course the requirements you know, with global health engagement seem to, and the demand seems to outweigh the supply, and for me, the enablers are uh, disparate funding sources. Uh, one, the ODACA funding, which I know our, our combatant command surgeons know quite well. Uh, TCA funding, which is fairly limited. Uh, and then organic funding that may come out of the components. Um, and then I also, we also considered resources, uh, human, re human capital resources, which is the Air Force IHS program the Navy's somewhat nascent global health engagement uh, capability that we are actively developing, and, and then the Army, and I'm sorry I may not have that way, right, Colonel Hemingway, but um, the Army's global health uh, division, who, which uh, just stood up. So again, again, the idea that it's not just the funding streams, but the, the, we're also trying to look at the man, train, and equip piece. Okay, and at the bottom, uh, we get, what are we doing for the joint force uh, in terms of What's the opportunity cost? Are we making a difference? Is there value? So again, I, met, I mentioned it previously, it depends on where you sit. So we had to say, what did we have in front of us? Well, we did have a data source in front of us, which was something called OASIS, which is Defense Security Cooperation Agency's Overseas Humanitarian and Shared Inf Information System. It's more than a mouthful. And we also had TISMIS, which is the Theater Security Cooperation Management Information System. The problem with TISMIS is that it should be sort of the universe of any engagement, any security cooperation engagements that go downrange. The problem is it's on the high side. Now, we're, they're migrating to global TISMIS, and I'm not sure where that's going to exactly end up. But so we had to grab what we, we could get. So one of the, the sources we, we actively engaged with was with uh, Defense Security Cooperation Agency. 
Um, so again, the idea of development of a learning tool, development of a process is based on aggregated data. So aggregated data, if you look at the top, is more on that sort of combatant command, uh, GEF sort of level. And then as you go down, we also looked at, we had a, a course partnering. We partnered with several organizations who needed to understand uh, other processes to make sure that uh, we were on the right track. One was, um, we did look at the, the Navy Mars system, uh, the Navy Medicines Mars system. Uh, we did uh, engage, had several discussions with the Air Force A-9 on uh, their process. We also uh, sat down with RAND. Uh, they did a very similar uh, sort of study, but looking at state fragility, but again, an econometric-based study that's very similar to our own. So we had uh, several discussions with RAND. And then at the, the bottom there, uh, again, the importance of tactical level engagement. Uh, so one idea is, again, standardizing process, .MLPF. It's, it's a construct that many understand. Maybe that's if we're looking at building a capacity and a, a capability in a, a partner nation, maybe indoctrinate, indoctrinating it and standardizing a standard way of doing it. That might be something that we, uh, we can move out on. And then again, in-country assessment. Uh, this is sort of the monitoring and evaluation piece. I know that uh, Captain Tarantino and Colonel Casuela were, were on a panel yesterday. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Waller mentioned some of the challenges with monitoring and evaluation. Absolutely has a huge, important place in what we're doing. When we're, we're building a capability, understanding if we're taking a capability uh, and building it with a host nation, there, there is most likely value there. Again, standardizing process is important. I'm up more on the aggregated data level because that's where I need to be right now. That's not to marginalize the contributions at the tactical level because those are equally important just at different levels. So I look, at, look from the past. If anybody uh, under, knows the work of John Boyd, a, one, uh, I, I guess one of the uh, preeminent uh, strategic theorists, uh, former Air Force colonel that came up with the OODA loop. And so when I first briefed this, uh, it was back in October, I got um, some great constructive input from General Rob. So th thank you, sir. I also got uh, some constructive input from uh, Daz D. Smith, um, the Joint Staff, and several others. And when we looked at our, I had a very linear way of thinking, which was I had the learning tool, and I had the process, uh, and, and, and generally the general comments were, to, were from all of them were, well, why are, we do, why are you looking at it lin as these things being independent? They should be fused together. So very great uh, comments and to be actively learning the idea, uh, taking again from, um, from, uh, uh, from uh, John Boyd, the idea of, uh, again, re continuing, always looking at the process again and again, uh, looking at, um, again, what are we doing again and again to, to do this better. Uh, so the idea here in the first uh, quadrant is the observe, which is, again, the data management. Uh, the idea that in some way we have to standardize data practices. We have to come in with a standardized way of doing this or we're not going to get better, essentially. Okay. In the lower quadrant, Orient, which was Mr. Boyd's, uh, that was really his focus quadrant, the idea that uh, we have to integrate this, show value, integrate this, integrate global health engagement into the PB, PPBE process, but also understand uh, that we, we're, we can publish findings, but also have a place uh, that can take the take global health engagement, sort of a, a thought leader organization that can take global health engagement uh, and move it forward. And one of the, the thoughts there is because again, the, the, the components and the combatant commands are very, they have small staffs. And again, the idea is to create a resource for them. Uh, moving into the, the other quad, the next quadrant, the, the, um, the decide quadrant, again, what capabilities are important, uh, collecting data, developing hypotheses, asking those important if-then questions. Um, when I did my initial scrub and input of um, the JP322, which is the security cooperation revision, um, it clearly states uh, that we do need to ask if-then questions um, when we look at the value of security cooperation. And then moving up into the, the higher left quadrant, uh, again, collecting data, measures of performance, uh, 
turning them into measures of effectiveness, looking at asking the if-then questions. When, when my team, when the team and, and the work with the committee comes to, and we have discussions, we always, I always ask, against what? If we're gonna leverage, if we're gonna look at data, if we're going to ask questions about whether this engagement was successful or if this intermediate military objective was successful, it's successful against what? And then the other part of that is we have to look at, we have to look at where we're at, uh, where we're engaging, but we also have to look at where we're not engaging. And one of the primary purposes is if we're spending money downrange and we're getting the same buck by not investing somewhere, that's, an important, that's important to know. Maybe something else is pushing the needle on policy. As well as if we are getting lots of return on, uh, return on in our investment, then we should know that too because then we should hone those capabilities, we should structure education and training to those capabilities, and then we should, again, leverage and see what we're doing right. In, I do have to mention, I, I, I trimmed this uh, slide presentation down considerably in that there's a backup in my, in the backup slides, there's a lot more detail on each one of the, uh, on each one of the quadrants in my uh, fused OODA loop, and so that can ask, uh, hopefully uh, provide a little bit of, of additional detail for, for anybody that, who's interested. So where are we at? Uh, so this is where we're at with our recommendations. Again, some of this is limited by what as a committee that we control. Uh, we can control for, for us right now um, what data that we can take on. Uh, certainly, I, I've heard lots of discussion. Uh, there's four things that I know as a committee we've come up against um, that we, we don't have good definitions for. One is interoperability, one is capacity building, one is access, and one is partnership. They're not in the JP 102, and if they're not in the JP 102, that creates a problem because then by doctrine, I don't know how to I need to make sure that we're synced together and then I can take those on and try to measure them. Um, so we did do, we, we've, uh, again, in our cross-collaboration, the, the committee has gone out, looked at where standardized definitions for some of these things are. And again, we need, we need to get better at these, in some of these areas, is standardizing the way that we do things. Uh, uh, and again, uh, part of the, the process that we're trying to do is not only uh, engage uh, our partners uh, willingly and take their input, but also validate the hypothesis that we ask. That's another important, asking those if-then questions. Some of the, the sharpest questions I get are from the people that we engage with, especially that come from the combatant, because they're doing it. The components and the combatant commands are doing these activities on a daily basis, and any, again, the idea that we're using the knowledge actively that we're gaining from them and asking the right questions. The next level down is the act, and you'll see it's sort of inverted here again because it's what the committee can control at this point, is again looking at uh, what are the appropriate measures of performance and measures of effectiveness. Again, looking at um, our process is econometric based because it's aggregated data. So honing our process, and then again looking at um, how we can better share the data that we have. Uh, what, is gonna, what is gonna make sense for our policymakers? Uh, we initially, uh, we're probably a little bit too number focused. Uh, I was very interested in showing statistical significance uh, on a sort of the eye chart of numbers. That does not do it. That, that cannot, and I, I had to step away from that and say, that might be fine in academics, but it's, it's, that's not meaningful to somebody that has to make a quick decision on what is truly, uh, what we can truly leverage as a capability. So we changed that to more of a stoplight chart. So some of the products that we're doing were, were again, the idea of uh, destructing our own, going back to John Boyd, looking at our processes as hard as we can and making them valuable. That's something that we're trying to infuse into our committee work. The last two items here, last two recommendations, are largely sort of beyond our committee's control. Those are things that we are going to make recommendations uh, when we have the ability to go to the general uh, committee uh, with Dazzy Smith, General West, uh, and uh, Mr. Tregilio, and make recommend recommendations involving uh, GILIS, uh, which is the Joint Lesson Learn Information System. It's not just enough to collect the data that's out there in the OASIS system or TISMIS. GILIS is important is because it's the lessons learned information system and it's 
It's not just all the, all the services provide lessons learned into that system. We haven't cultivated that system. But again, if we're getting success in after action reports and we're seeing general themes of capability, we should harness that power. So Jillis is an area that we wanna, we wanna fuse together with some of the more quantitative things like Oasis, which is looking at, again, cost. It, we're also, on the front end of Oasis, we're looking at, I, I mentioned uh, some, uh, some may have been in the room yesterday, a balanced risk scorecard for uh, Defense Security Cooperation Agency to measure, to, to give a, a, again, a score chart of what investments might be, we, we might be able to make and what engagements might look better than others. That's something that we're also very interested in doing. Um, and then at the bottom there is, well, again, the idea of fusing the parts together. At some point, we would like to embed the data and the tool together for our planners. And that's, again, these are, these are things that are not gonna happen tomorrow, but if we uh, can integrate uh, then I think we have a, a, a large chance to go forward with our recommendations. Um, and then the, on, on the bottom there, again, the idea that, uh, a st again, for standardized process, um, interoperability uh, of the analysis function, uh, and then make, just making sure that um, as we learn lessons, we can feed that back out. Uh, because again, it's only, it's only gonna be impactful if they're implemented at some point. I, I can hold all the data I want, but if I'm not sharing that, and our leaders, uh, our leaders at the, the combatant commands, at the joint staff, aren't acting on those, uh, those information or those policy recommendations, then all I've done is either created a great article or, again, I've, I've stovepiped myself. So again, the idea here, the fall, and I, I agree with uh, John Boyd, integration is the key. So key takeaways, one size doesn't fit all. When you're looking at, when you're asking a question, because I can, uh, I can very easily uh, sit there and measure a specific intermediate military objective and say, okay, uh, we can look at that. I could, I could also ratchet it down and look at a tactical level. Acti They're all important. But again, the idea of having a standardized process. Uh, demand, supply and demand. Unfortunately, we're just in the, the era that we're in. There's going to be more demand, and there's not going to be enough supply of resources. And for me, that's important because this is why this measures of effectiveness. If I have a capability that's making a difference, let's hone that, let's look at that. Let's look at it again and again and again and test it and see, well, if I'm employing it in Africa, understanding the context in Africa is much different, but is it something that could also potentially be employed in PACOM? I'm not sure. Uh, I know that Daz D. Smith uh, mentioned uh, the DHAP. Uh, we're actually working with Dr. Rick Schaefer out there to look at uh, more, uh, more tactical level uh, engagements for the DHAP program, but we're also looking at the aggregated DHAP data. And again, the problem here is, is that data included in the larger set? And right now, it's not. So as we, when we look at uh, security cooperation in total, we gotta make sure that those engagements, all the health engagements are logged, and it, it's just as important, in, in, I know this is gonna be blasphemy for some, but, it, <laughs> The, the RVU inside an MTF is hugely important. It's predicated on any workload. And in, the counting of an engagement, a theater security cooperation engagement, is also hugely important. Because again, it shows what sort of value. What the descriptive statistics that we can get is, if a combatant commander keeps going back to the well, and he keeps leveraging health, I can't tell you how effective that health is. But what I can tell you is there must be some implied value there because why would you continue as a steward of taxpayers' money? Why would I go back to something again and again and again? I can't, again, what I'm trying to do and what the group's trying to do is the, the tasks that were set upon us are, again, demonstrating where we add value. Uh, and if we can do that as a group and as a committee and leverage some of the recommendations that we made, I think that we can we can truly depict the value that health brings to the table. And, and with that, uh, I think I had some, um, I, actually this is a great place for me to stop, and I think I'll, I'll turn it over at this point to uh, Colonel Hemingway. And I, unfortunately, again, I apologize, I have to step away. Thank you all. Well, good morning, everyone. General Wall, Daz D. Smith, um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this morning. Let's see if we can get there. There we 
we are. So first of all, this, this brief today is pre-decisional, and um, I'm going to be given the eight recommendations that are coming out of the uh, Provision of Care uh, Committee, and um, want to provide the agenda that I'm going to be speaking from today. And also talk about the provision of care committee because um, this is a very important committee. Uh, in 2010, the Medical Stability Operation Working Group um, briefed the Force Health Protection Integration Council on the policy gaps related to the provision of care and also for the medical rules of engagement, for medical ethics, for stability operations as uh, Dr. Smith has already uh, alluded to. And um, DOD IG reports also highlighted some of the gaps. So um, a couple of things that we wanted to do was to uh, look at the provision of care that was being provided when we deployed and when we were pro providing care to foreign nations. The business uh, case for the provision of care provided for um, the logistics of how we would operate. And I think this is uh, also important because it stipulated that we had to have uh, two co-chairs and all of the services were represented. And the important take home point that I want to make here is that if you're looking at uh, this committee, many of you probably work with many of the individuals that are on this committee, and you know that they've had a wealth of experience so far as uh, global health engagements are uh, concerned, and they are able to contribute significantly to um, the outcome of these recommendations that are being made. Um, also, if you're looking, you see that um, I stepped in in October and took over the subcommittee from uh, uh, Colonel George G uh, Goodwin and also Colonel um, um, uh, Haston also stepped in in November and um, took over for Dr. Jules DeLon. Um, so the work that you see here basically uh, is because of the leadership of uh, the Colonel Goodwin and Dr. DeLon plus the committee members. I also want to thank Susan Silverman for the assistance that she has given us in staying ahead of the gang. As already been pointed out, the P Provision of Care Committee had uh, deliverables, and this is the deliverable that we had. Um, we also were looking, looked at several DODs and other regulations to um, shape uh, the recommendations that were coming up. Uh, came up with. Um, and again, the expectation for the committee uh, in terms of the outcome is that an international health care work frame addressing the provision of care to partner nations, civilians, medical ethics, and credentialing and licensing issues for the stability operation uh, mission. Recommendation number one that came out of the committee is that the, the proposed DOD policy should assign policy oversight responsibility for direct clinical care provided by the licensed DOD personnel engaged in all military operations. Important points that I um, want to bring up here is that, again, um, the committee wanted to make sure that our recommendations were very broad as these are cornerstones for future policy. Also, the services um, per the Title X authority uh, wanted to ensure that the organization, the training, and the equipment of the TSGs were maintained. Also, in support of um, ASD Health Affairs, the responsibility that they have for, for policy that, that was ensured. So that was 
always uh, at the uh, tip of, our, of the spear when looking at these uh, recommendations that we came up with. Recommendation number two, all operations within the clinical component should be guided by written uh, medical rules of engagement um, and consideration of principles and principles of the clinical outcome to be achieved, the summary of the application, um, international law, um, the assessment of the capabilities, and the medical rules of engagement. And these are, are, are very important because of the fact that um, the clinical care that is provided, uh, we wanted to make sure also that the global health engagement piece was, was being addressed, but also providers are really concerned that when they are providing care in a theater, that what they do um, is not going to be uh, punitive, and that um, also that if they do not provide care, that that is not going to be punitive. And those are very important considerations um, um, to be able to provide care with confidence, knowing that um, that, that care, uh, of what they're doing, is um, not going to uh, result in some legal action. So that was some of the um, concerns for this provision number two. Uh, again, uh, that was, uh, as was pointed out, we have the rules of engagement. We also have uh, the COCOM's expectations when we're coming into a COCOM in terms of what uh, we can or cannot do. So again, always using um, policies, regulations that currently exist to guide uh, the recommendation that uh, we came up with. Recommendation number three, uh, the DOD global health engagements where directed uh, Clinical care is provided should comply with applicable inter international sovereign nation and United um, States laws. And much of this discussion around this recommendation dealt with the protection for clinicians uh, without licensing. So for our medics um, and uh, these uh, medics, corpsmen and airmen, uh, what they do falls under the physician and the nurse. Uh, that was important. But we also wanted to make sure that we looked at the respect of the host nation authority and that we didn't want to appear as we were uh, coming into an area of operation and trying to take over. So that was some of the consideration that went into um, this particular recommendation. The provision of care, uh, recommendation number four, all DOD health engagements where direct clinical care is provided to ensure that the patient or the patient's representative uh, receives a full and culturally appropriate description of the services to be provided. Um, and then the rights and the wishes of the patient are respected at all times. Some of the discussion that went into this recommendation centered around the, the fact that we have to uh, be able to provide care that is sustainable. Uh, many of the times when we go into a theater to provide care, um, we find that um, some of the care may not be sustainable. And so we want to make sure that there are ways to sustain the care even after we leave. Um, and also, there are times we go into a country doing goodwill, but we have to consider the ability of the country uh, to provide the same level of care that we have provided. And uh, basically what I uh, mean by that is that we may have the Mercedes so far as uh, care is concerned, and the host nation country may not be at that same level. So again, making sure that we're working with host nations prior to going in to ascertain the level of care that is there so that any care that is provided is congruent with what is um, going to be uh, there when we leave. Also looking at, the again, the infrastructure, supplies, and uh, um, just uh, the basic requirements to ensure 
that uh, we can uphold that once we leave. So recommendation number five, all DOD health and glo glo uh, global health engagements where clinical care is provided should respect the autonomy of the host nation. And uh, again, as mentioned, um, there are times when we are providing mentoring opportunities that we need to ensure that our scope of, uh, of care matches what we provide. Um, while uh, training builds goodwill between the United States and host nations. Uh, again, we should also be cognizant of the fact that um, um, of the political and the diplomacy issues uh, that involve. Um, recommendation number six, the um, global health engagements where uh, direct care is provided should always work to integrate the patient care um, into the host nation's, nation, nation's medical system. We've already talked about this one um, to some extent, uh, making sure that, again, that the appropriate planning is undertaken when going into a country as this will help reduce um, um, uh, care that may not be sustainable. And uh, recommendation number seven, uh, where direct clinical care is provided, we may be used to provide teaching opportunities, but clinical teaching should fall within uh, the documented scope of, of practice. And um, again, uh, we provide opportunities to ensure uh, that um, the care is sustainable, but the scope has to match uh, the care that is provided. Then finally, uh, recommendation number eight. Any decision to provide unplanned care must be informed by uh, recommendations two through seven with added emphasis on recommendation four, six, and five. And we felt like uh, this was very important because the provider must consider, uh, again, indirect harm um, that might impact the perception of um, the econ uh, economic uh, visibility of the uh, local medical community as a result of the health engagement. And uh, also, we uh, operate within our constraints to accomplish a very important mission. Again, we have to ensure that we're assessing uh, the capabilities that are currently there so that we can match the care with uh, what uh, the locals uh, currently have in place. And we recognize that um, in a non-permissive environment, assessment of uh, capabilities and priorities may not uh, be achieved, nor uh, may there be medical resources available and uh, capable of uh, completing an assessment. However, we need to try to ensure that we get some form of assessment in so that um, the care is congruent. So in summary, um, what this committee has done, we have come up with eight pre-decisional uh, recommendations that are being presented here today. We also have come up with a white paper that will go uh, be used as input uh, into a revised DOD or a new DOD and the way ahead is the um, Global Health Working Committee that will um, make a decision on the 18th of December. Um, so uh, the recommendations from the committee provides necessary protection to the military provider. We wanted to make sure that any of the recommendations that were coming out of uh, this committee emphasize that uh, and also uh, we wanted to also ensure that uh, we regarded the host nation's sovereignty at all times. So, um, sir, without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. What, what we're going to do is we've got a lot to cover in a short amount of time, and so what we're going to do, we're gonna, the folks are all going to stay behind. And then we're going to have uh, Colonel Hastings come up and, uh, and from the Joint Staff to talk, and then we're going to bring them all together as a panel. Uh, it makes sense because they're all they're all talking again, uh, what I call in, 
and uh, an integrated uh, approach to this. And then we can, if we can, we can hold all the questions to the end when we have everybody together. Thanks. Good morning. I'm aware it's uh, 11:35, so we'll go through this um, pretty quickly and, and expeditiously. Um, uh, again, it goes without saying that our committee is also comprised, uh, very fortunately, of a tri-service and uh, interagency representation, very uh, heavily represented with the DHA, which turned out to be very uh, fortuitous. Uh, as Dr. S uh, Smith uh, alluded to earlier, the DHE is a very uh, complex uh, area uh, to undertake, and of paramount importance for us was to work with the adjudicated uh, definition. Once we had that in hand, uh, we won't spend the next two hours going over each of these documents. Uh, we went through over 70 documents and did a cloud search looking for medical health terms uh, that we uh, elicited from each of these. Starting off the top tier were strategic documents such as NSS, National Military Security, uh, QDR, QDDR, et cetera. Then we went down to the DODs, DODDs the, the other issuances of the government, uh, the joint pubs, et cetera. And then we flowed down to service specific publications and then finally other non-US government uh, documents that we felt were relevant such as commissioned RAND studies, uh, the Kaiser family uh, report that Dr. Smith uh, alluded to earlier. And uh, from that, um, I apologize, the, the initial slider here had other colors in blue. This is not an Air Force bias slide, it just, just came out poorly here, I apologize. Uh, but what we found it was... Is, uh, deep sea blue, air superiority blue. Roger, ultramarine Air Force blue. Roger, Roger. what else you got in there? <laughs> uh, I think Kelly's in there as well. Uh, well, that's green, I guess, for, for the Army. Uh, anyway, what emerged out of here is uh, several... Um, broad categories, and I'll let you read for themselves, that uh, we found uh, consistently throughout the documents, uh, specifically the, the top two building relationships and building partner capacity, uh, that time and time again uh, resonated throughout these documents, whether it's a U.S. government uh, source document or a RAND analysis. And we'll pull into the, to the next slide to discuss these in a little bit more detail. What I would like to say is that, I don't know if you have any personnel or human resource specialists out there, we, we label these essentially as uh, capabilities, but uh, human resource individuals pr probably classify these as competencies, uh, which are supported by knowledge, skills, and abilities that we'll get to. And really, when we looked at training and educational requirements, we kind of scoped those and tailored those to developing those KSAs that we felt were important uh, for these uh, competencies. So in the same uh, set of documents, we search for the organizational attributes as well as the training, educational, and experiential exposures that we felt would enable successful execution and performance of these competencies. These findings were then distributed to the combatant command staffs for adjudication and, uh, and um, additional refinement. And in this chart before us, we see the top row list those competencies, those sum of actions that the MHS as an enterprise needs to be able to accomplish uh, and it's important to realize that we don't expect that any one individual or organization uh, would necessarily be expected to manifest each one of these. Rather, the MHS as a corporate entity would profess all of them through the summation of all of the three services, uh, resources, and capabilities. If we skip down to the bottom or at the bottom of the slide, we have labeled as human capital enablers. These are the training, educational, and operational experiences to develop those KSAs that we, we talked about earlier. And as our committee has reviewed these, we're pleased to realize that with uh, very few exceptions, these opportunities, these training and educational operational experiences are already being successfully utilized and um, taken advantage of by MHS members in all three branches of the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, interestingly, or increasingly, distance learning opportunities are also being brought to the forefront from uh, organizations such as Uniformed Services University to make this more cost effective and available uh, across the uh, DOD enterprise as well. Um, in very few areas, uh, there are a few gaps, but we anticipate that the forthcoming recommendations from the Provision of Care Committee uh, regarding ethics will help close that final gap. Now on the chart before us, the, between the capabilities and the human ca capital enablers are the organizational enablers. And these are the attributes which should be manifest within the MHS as a whole, but again, not necessarily realized with any one specific organization uh, equal to the others. For example, some organizations may be more deployable than others, and uh, not all will have the equal commitment or any commitment to education and training of partner nation uh, medical resources. Now, having said all that, it's important to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge that with varying degrees, of deliberate planning and efficacy over the last several decades, the DOD has been actively engaged in global health engagement. However, just in the last five to 15 years, 
We've learned important lessons and have codified those into cable guidance and other issuances. However, gaps still remain. Earlier this year, the Joint Staff appointed the Army as the lead agent to develop a DOD .mil PF construct for global health engagement. To support that challenge, our committee is looking at four components of such a .mil PF construct to focus our recommendations. And those are organization, personnel, training, and leadership. Organization is critically important as it shapes the presentation of the forces to the combatant commands for global health engagement. As each of us probably realizes, an enormous variety of units and organizations directly or indirectly contributes to global health engagement. Some are very well defined. For example, at the joint level, with the, current, uh, with the uh, current exception of SOUTHCOM, each combatant command has Air Force International Health Specialist staff dedicated to full-time global health engagement, advising, planning, and coordination. Based on a survey of each of the combatant command staffs, all can easily validate a significantly higher number of full-time equivalents dedicated to that purpose. And in fact, most, uh, if not all of them, would also like to see a tri-service contribution at this level, primarily to help to coordinate with their respective component commands. To further com uh, support the combatant commands, which is the ultimate goal of all of us in the Department of Defense, additional resources found in the component commands, DHA, Uniform Services University, and other key institutions would potentially benefit from augmentation or slight reorganization to encourage synergy. In each of the services, although virtually any troop from any unit can contribute to GHE, the majority of health, secur uh, health security cooperation or building partnership capability uh, work is done by relatively few organizations or platforms. The Army certainly contributes very heavily through civil affairs, vet, uh, vet corps, special forces teams and overseas labs, etc. The Navy has populated a great variety of health liaison and attache positions and also maintains labs and, and uh, hospital ships, which have enormous impact. The Air Force shares with the Navy responsibility for mobile training teams at the Defense Institute for Medical Operations, but also staffs officers at the combatant commands and the components uh, within the Air Force. But despite this wide variety, there's a need for individuals who are particularly knowledgeable and experienced in the competencies des described earlier. There is a value in, ha in having a population of joint and somewhat interoperable GHE professionals, that's global health engagement professionals, who share a basic common understanding of this complex field, yet belong to the different services with varying resources and operational platforms. One of the challenges in personnel will be how to identify and track these individuals who are especially well prepared to perform global health engagement, given the different roles they may be expected to perform in their respective services. The solution to this may be a core identifier with modifiers that reflect additional skills appropriate for a given AOR, level of command, or functional contributions. Through this, we could validate an entry-level set of knowledge and skills while avoiding a commitment to a comprehensive but potentially unnecessary and excessively burdensome universal training that covers all potential roles. We're just about to, to wrap it up here. An additional personnel uh, consideration should be how their involvement could affect their careers, and I'll gloss over what I prepared for that, but I will stress that uh, there may be a role for a regional uh, identification and alignment with these individuals as well. Exactly 12 months ago, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, uh, re released a uh, memorandum uh, that uh, indicated a need to more deliberately develop across the entire Department of Defense future leaders who are specifically groomed and developed with an in-depth regional orientation, and uh, certainly this may be applicable to GHE specialists as well. Therefore, predicated on the needs of the individual or the identified GHE specialist, training and educational requirements would be established to qualify one to be a global health specialist uh, or other similar identifier. Again, these requirements can be trained or scaled to reflect tiered capabilities using online, mobile training, and in-residence courses. And then finally, as was alluded to earlier in this presentation by others, leadership development is critical for both the line and medical officers. Combatant command, uh, commanders as well as component commanders need to understand the unique advantages and limitations that global health engagement officers uh, offer to regional security goals. PME and pre-command courses should definitely include this information. Medical leaders likewise need to understand the value of global health engagement. This is most obvious for incoming combatant command and component surgeons, but also to uh, MTF commanders who are asked to release their staff to support global health missions 
is they need to understand their strategic value and how to justify their potential impact on lost RVUs or patient encounters to their commanders in terms of medical readiness benefits and also uh, maybe uh, perhaps morale and, and other benefits along those lines. In summary, the DOD is doing a more deliberate job in planning and programming for GHE than just 10 or 15 years ago, and we're getting better among the services. Challenges do exist with synchronizations between the combatant commands components, SOF and GPS, and inter interagency, but our capability committee anticipates that with additional recommendations and changes for personnel, organization, training, and leadership, uh, the, uh, in the future, we'll have a more effective, integrated, and efficient MH enterprise that's greater than the sum of the components from the separate sister services. Additionally, shortcomings exist in data collection and analysis to inform our investments, but with better information that will likely come from the measures of, of uh, efficacy committee's efforts, we believe that future tri-service global health engagement officers who benefit from more completely shared understanding from uh, common training and education will definitely make a difference leveraging this information. They'll be able to use the data from TISMAS and from OASIS and other sources to plan a more synchronized system to achieve the important goals that Dr. Smith mentioned of stability, cooperation, and capability uh, building. Thank you very much. All right, and I think uh, what Colonel Hastings is about to uh, go through will be very complimentary of this work as it's going to, uh, it's all meant to support our overall uh, global health engagement and COCOMs, and I want to thank uh, all of our presenters, and um, we're ready for Colonel Hastings, I think. All right, good. Thanks. Colonel Hastings come from the Joint Staff, and I think what, uh, what you're going to see is, and again, this has really been, been uh, again, it all dovetailed and nested, and uh, again, thanks to uh, Dr. Smith, he's got a, uh, keep moving. He's got uh, multiple engagements here today. So, Dr. Smith, appreciate your leadership on that. Uh, so, kind of what you got was uh, kind of what I call the big to small, and that's uh, you know you got a side picture of the policy, uh, and then you saw you know uh, the, you know the measures of uh, effectiveness. In other words, laying the groundwork and the framework for what now uh, Colonel Hastings from the Joint Staff is is is, is going to show taking that framework and how we're going to put it in the operational environment to execute uh, with the ways, means, and ends. So uh, if we can go ahead and get, are, are we all set to get her loaded up? Is she on there? Uh, we just got to get her mic'd up first. Okay. Good. And these folks here, of course, are going to stay and, and, and answer all kind of questions here at the end. You guys are ready. Right? I'm Absolutely. ready. All right, good. good. Testing. There we go. Okay. All right, hopefully this is going to be somewhat entertaining because I know that uh, this and the panel are all that stand between you and lunch. And you probably want to get out of here. Um, I'm going to let them pull up my presentation, but I want to let you guys know how I got here. Because um, it was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't know what I was going to be doing on uh, the 5th of December. Uh, and then there was a, a note that was sent in uh, at the end of June. I hadn't even gotten to the joint staff yet, and it was from... Uh, Michael Obar, who works for General Rob, and it says, hey Adam, General Rob told me about an hour ago, he thinks he asked you to prepare an AMSIS abstract for the topic DOD Global Health Engagement that Colonel Patricia Hastings will be making on, uh, at the AMSIS meeting in December. However, he's a little uncertain if he actually asked you this, so can you check on it? And Adam, when I got there, you know, around the 1st of July said, hey, we need you to write a, an abstract on global health engagement. I said, okay, no problem, first job. <laughs> And so I ended up here. So hopefully you'll be somewhat uh, entertained and enlightened. Um, you know, the previous um, speakers have done a great job of talking about the core of trying to create some of this. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the joint staff view and the chairman's view. And, um, and it was all new to me in, uh, in uh, July when I got there. Um, but you know how um, I'm a staffer. I'm an ER doc by training, but I've learned a lot watching this, you know, working with, uh, looking at the policy, looking at the joint staff. And you know how really important people have really short names like God, Senator, Sink? Well, when I first got into disaster work after my disaster fellowship, I was the medical director of the Center of Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance, a World Health Organization Collaborative Center for Civil and Military Relations. I think that puts my place in the world in perspective. <laughs> so, um, 
If I could ask just a little bit about the audience, how many of you work, have worked in a tactical humanitarian engagement operation of some sort? Pretty much everybody. How many of you work, have worked at the operational level where you kind of put it all together across um, different agencies or groups? Wow. Um, I can sit down now. My work is done. <laughs> and how many of you have done it at a policy level? Okay, I'm leaving. It's over. Um, so we're going to just be talking a little bit about this, and I'll see. There we go. Okay, no financial disclosures. Um, it'd be nice to be a little richer with financial disclosures, but nothing here. Um, so when we talk about the common operating picture, you can, you can see there that we're saying that the combatant commanders should have this as a, a tool in their, in their toolbox, in their armamentarium. They should be able to use this. But if I could draw your attention to the, the very bottom bullet, we need to be able to synergize. We don't need to be doing what the other parts of the U.S. government are doing. And in fact, when the chairman looked at the Ebola outbreak, and I'm going to use that as an example, he said, okay, we're going to do those things that are military unique. We're not going to do the other things that can be done by other agencies or the interagency. And he was very clear, we were going to be doing the training, we were going to be doing the logistics and the heavy lift, we were going to be going to do the command and control, and we were going to do the engineering. We weren't going to do those things that other people could do. And we have to remember that this is a tool for commanders. It is not an end in itself. And sometimes we all have a, how many of the people in here are medical? Probably everybody, yeah. Okay, we all have a character flaw. We all think that doctor, nurse, medical service corps, we all think that's, that those are verbs. And so we, we can't make this the end in itself. We need to make sure that it is a tool that we are supporting, we are not supported. And pretty much the, the unique thing about us is we all wear a uniform and we are, we are the mill-to-mill -mill engagement because frankly no one else in the government can do that. No one else can do the mill-to-mill -mill engagements and that's the most important for us. Um, unique about the, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, it was started in 1947 after World War II when they were looking at some reorganization. But it wasn't the classic German model that we built so much of our, our different staffs on. It was something that was uniquely American. He doesn't control troops, but he controls putting together doctrine and putting together the resources for us to do our jobs and making sure that, um, that he looks at the full spectrum of the joint and the combined joint being between the services and combined being with our allies. Um, he is there to advise the president. He is there to advise the secretary of defense. And so he has a lot of influence. And right now, General Dempsey, um, and I think anyone to the, into the future, and the previous chairmen also, look at global health engagement as being a very important tool to get us into places um, to, to support our allies, to, um, to stabilize the world, and to make it a safer place for all of us. Um, and again, uh, it is quite unique. He, uh, he makes it very clear that when he is looking at things that he wants to get input from everyone before he starts to put out um, you know, doctrine or other things in the joint environment. When we look at global health engagement, you know, we always talk about the, the ends, ways, and means. And we'll, we'll talk specifically about the ways on one of the next slides, but the means, pretty much we are mill to mill. That it's all sort of nested in each other, but usually we're mill to mill. Every once in a while, we're mill to sieve. Anybody been involved in some mill to sieve activities? If I could ask you, Colonel Mitchell, what would be a mill to sieve activity that you had? Speak into the navel. Uh, build, an <clears throat> build an amputee care program for Estonia since they had both military and tons of civilians that were injured. But to get to the military, you had to go through a, the bigger pipeline. Absolutely. That, that's a really good example. Anybody have any other examples of Miltisiv that they've worked with? I saw a couple other hands. I'm going to let you yell since I can't get okay. over there. Um, in the Philippines, we, we uh, helped develop a uh, emergency response capability with a local barangay health workers. And so it was teaching them how to <coughs> use their ambulance as an ambulance and not just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's huge because some of that's very much a cultural change. Um, because they're, they're not used to some of those things. 
So um, occasionally we'll also do mill to sieve when we do, are doing mill with host nation because we may want to help, for example, in Mongolia, um, a lot of their young males were not healthy enough for the military and they were worried about that with smoking and all those other things. And so they, they've worked with um, host nations in some cases on public health missions in order to provide a more stable environment. Um, you know, child soldiers is another area where um, we've worked with some host nations. Then we also have the, the disaster relief. That's something where we would work interagency, we would work with the host nation, we would work with civilians. Um, so we do it all, but we really are the only ones, and our primary role is in the mill to mill with global health engagement. When we look at the, the ways, partnerships, building partnerships, building trust, um, you know, going out and meeting our partners. Um, it comes, uh, you know, comes with the territory. Uh, you know, medical is pretty much regarded as neutral. And so we can do a lot of things that our counterparts can't. Uh, we can get into places that they're not able to. Um, we can help with making sure that uh, our partners are able to work with, uh, with us interoperably with trauma care. Uh, we've done some work with uh, post-deployment um, health assessments, post-deployment mental health, um, and those are, are very important things. For example, uh, when I uh, went for Captain Weiss, I, I went on a mission for him down to uh, Tanzania and, um, and Uganda, and we looked at the, you know, the deployment mental health issues um, that people had coming back from Somalia when they were in some of the, the UN um, missions. Security, um, biosurveillance, Dr. Smith talked about that extensively. He has you know, the, the map that shows everything that's going on um, that he has visibility of, as Admiral Chin pointed out. They have quite a few other things going on in different AORs um, that may not have made it to the map. Um, the international health regulations, making sure that those are adhered to, um, very important with the health security, and our emerging disease response. Primary example of um, is Ebola. When I, got to, uh, when I got to the Joint Staff, I thought I was going to be doing global health engagement and I did global Ebola engagement. And, um, and that's been about it. And in fact, I, I've, um, I've called up my, my uh, predecessor who actually did a lot of these sl slides, Colonel uh, Mark Hubner, who is in Wright-Patterson. And I told him how busy it was, what Congress wanted, um, he commiserated with me a little bit and then just laughed and said it was a clean getaway. <laughs> yeah, a lot of sympathy from your friends, right? Okay, and then stability. Um, militaries can be a very stabilizing influence on um, different governments and we can't forget that. And, you know, so we can get in there with global health engagement and we can look at gender issues, we can look at violence, we can look at the international uh, humanitarian law. Um, all of these critical items, um, and, and we can get there when other people can't. Just an interesting thing, and it wasn't a, a medic that did it, but when you look at um, the, the impact we can have going into a place, um, there was a, a Jeffrey Atticott who is now retired, but he was a lawyer. Um, and I know we have a, a little, you know, our tips with, um, any lawyers in here? No one that will admit to it. But you know, he, he did an amazing thing. Southcom, uh, they were having a number of disappearances, euphemistically referred to as disappearances in, uh, in Peru. And um, basically they were people that the military had taken somewhere and, and probably done away with. And they said, this can't keep happening. And so about a decade ago, uh, the commander of Southcom said, you're going to go down to Peru and you are going to, to teach people international humanitarian law and what an unlawful order is. And when he got down there, the generals came up to him and said, so we're gonna have a two-week class and then you're gonna sign us off and we're gonna start getting money again, right? And he goes, no, this is going to be a year-long ordeal. I want you to sign this letter that says I am going to teach every single person in your military about international humanitarian law and, um, and military orders, et cetera. And they did, it was a year. He had to put together some books that had no words in it, I had to learn a, uh, um, you know, because many of the people in the military were functionally illiterate. He had to, you know, he had pictures of torture drawn up there with, you know, the thing we think of the person in the dungeon, you know, with the chains, and they said, oh no, we don't do it like that. <laughs> and so he had to get different drawings done. But it made a huge difference because in the first year after his class, 
they had had about 300 disappearances the year before. It went down to 150. The year after that, it halved again. It was less than 70. And they took three field grade officers to courts martial. Amazing. So, you know, the, the things that we do can have a huge impact, and health is one of those. So again, you know, we are the base. We are the mill-to-mill, -mill, the only ones that can do it by virtue of the uniform we wear. And disaster relief, something where we can make a huge difference as, as we already have, um, you know, uh, Colonel Zarnik, who's in the uh, audience, you know, he's um, disaster central when it comes to the, the Liberian response and intimately involved with every single part of that. But it, I think you would agree that, you know, without the, the military there sort of being the lubricant to, to you know, get the agencies working since many of the NGOs ha had left, um, that we were the lubricant to get them back. And so we have a very important role with uh, disaster relief, whether it is doing the, the bulk of the work or going in and helping with the bulk of the work or just going in and again um, giving a context for people to work in. I really wish Glenn Deal was here because I love this slide. Um, and basically, it looks at you know, the things that we still have to put together. Um, so gap one, the military medical development and where we are with our partners, how interoperable we are. And you know, sometimes we use different words, different languages between our own services. And I have sat in a couple Navy briefings where I thought I understood exactly what was being said. And it's really weird to hear your own language and come out of there a half an hour later and realize that you have not picked up anything. Um, gap two, um, health security, the emerging diseases, very important that we're doing that. And then gap three, um, just how we can use the military um, for stability in these, in these operations and st stabilizing a nation as well as having an ally. Usually, it's the global combat, um, combatant commanders that are going to have these roles, um, the joint operation concepts, um, and then the, uh, the Chairman's 2020 vision. All of these, the military are going to have involvement in, um, especially with um, global health and, um, engagement. There is a place for medical every single place here. Um, even in our own homeland defense, when you look at the, the national response framework, Who's the backstop for just about every one of the emergency support functions? What's it say? DOD. DOD, exactly. So, um, so, you know, whether or not we want to do it, whether or not we um, feel that we are the best ones to do it, we are going to be doing it. And we have a couple courses of action um, that we can take when we're working with people. Here is, you know, you can't read it very well. I need to move the slide a little bit, but minimal investment. Okay, we have um, an agreement with Bandaria, you know, that we, you know, will work together if we need to. Um, we don't really do much um, because there's, you know, focus on other areas. And then an event happens. And we've seen this time and time again. The U.S. goes in really big. It's costly in personnel, time, and equipment. It takes the, the nation quite a while to build itself up. And eventually we put together our exit strategy. But in this case, we're gonna be there for a long time and it's gonna take a lot of our resources. Not the most efficient way. And we're, we're learning this. This is, this is sort of the old way we've done it for many, for many years past, but we're, we're getting out of this model. This model was sort of the next one, the, the next gen, um, and we've seen where we go in and, and we, we work you know, hard up front. Um, we help with disaster plans, we help with um, education, uh, we do exchanges. Um, an event happens, and we have um, the U.S. involved, but we're able to quickly scale down and make our transition plan, and Bandaria is more ready, um, more quickly. But probably the best and the one that we're moving to in, in uh, the, the future and, uh, and as much as possible today is where we look at the interagency and the, the different nations that we're working with. And we go in, we work with all the nations in an area, we you know, put our, our work up front, uh, and then when the event happens, we do much better. We're not, at, we're not having to put as many people, as many resources, as much money there, and we effectively have a response that is multi-sectorial, multi-agency, multi-nation, and a much more stable environment. 
So some of the best practices, and um, <coughs> Colonel Mitchell already talked about the, uh, the amputee care. The unfortunate reality in the world that we have today is the, the weapons that are used many times cause devastating injuries. We are able to save these people, which is the good news, um, but we have to make sure that we give them a life afterwards. And that is, is hard um, if, if people are in an environment in a, in a nation where they don't have these uh, things available to them. So working with our allies to put together amputee care system is very important. Um, the Balkan Medical Force, um, the, the role too in NATO um, sometimes needs a little bolstering and I loved the picture that you had. That was a fabulous picture when you were talking about pharmacy was done by one nation and the um, decon by another. Phenomenal. And you know that was part of the best practices that came out of UCOM. Um, the mill um, to civ engagement, the Romani, Ro Romania TB program is one the Estonia wounded, wounded Warrior, and then disaster preparation. You talked about um, the Philippine disaster response training that's been done, and that probably saved quite a few lives with the, the previous typhoon that came through. And we do that rather routinely, helping people put together their, their disaster plans so that they know how to use them. Because the worst thing that we can do is, and I've seen this happen in our own nation, in the different states, you know, a paper plan um, syndrome, where it looks great on paper, it's pretty, the margins are nice, but it doesn't work in real life um, because it's, it's um, not as close to real life as possible. So when we help them put together a disaster plan, we realize that it needs to be something that's workable, something that's short enough that people will actually read it, because even in, in our own country, when we looked at uh, Hurricane Andrew, um, when that hit, the, uh, the head of their emergency response had never read their plan. Um, and then Sea Angel, just another best practice. Um, I don't know if any of you, if, if any of you are interested in disaster work, you can learn a lot from previous case studies. And there's a book by Chris Seipel, um, and it's called The Military NGO Experience. And he writes basically case studies that he was a Marine who got out and then started working for one of the the um, NGOs, and uh, so when you talk about Sea Angel, they were steaming back from Somalia, and General Stackpole, a Marine general, um, was diverted to Bangladesh because of a cyclone. And the best practice that he had was the same practice that Colonel Zarnik um, said to me several times over the over the phone when I was talking to him at ungodly hours for him, but perfect for me. Um, <coughs> Thank goodness for that six hour time difference, right? Um, but uh, with regards to Sea Angel, he said, we are in a sovereign nation. We are not going to make any decision for the nation. We will ask them. We will provide advice if they need it. We will give them our best thoughts on it, but they are going to make the decision and we are going to back them up. Very effective response in that case. Saved many lives, got a lot of food in, a lot of people out, NGOs moved forward. He let them use the, uh, the ships as a platform for, um, for some of their meetings where he would bring them out so they could have meetings and interagency um, groups that would be able to plan the response more effectively, but that was also another best practice. Um, a slide similar to Dr. Smith's, looking at all of the places that were engaged around the world, because really when we look at it, we want to be effective, um, we want to hopefully get everybody moving in the same way instead of being the diagram below where the stairs go everywhere, up, down. You're not really sure where you are. Um, the one thing that we need to do is this does need to be in doctrine because it can't be someone's best thought. It can't be someone's pet project. It can't be something, global health engagement is too important to let it be something that is a passion of one person but not the emphasis of the next person. So we need to, to codify this. Um, put it into, into the doctrine and make it something that's whole and will remain um, intact, though it will mutate over time, for sure. And we have to do it partly also for just for the limited resources. We can do anything, but we can't do everything. And looking at it, um, again, mainly the interagency um, civilian will work with the, their civilian counterparts, and we're there to help with the mill, stabilize the environment, and also um, help with response in the disasters. 
because when you really get down to it, we're here for the soldier, we're here for the commander, we're here to make the world a safer place and global health engagement is one of those tools. Thank you. So we can use this time now in kind of a sort of a panel-like session. So uh, in, in kind of, um, you know, offer up this, uh, this opportunity to, uh, to make comments. I would be, uh, I'll ask the first question, but it's going to actually be directed to the audience. COCOM surgeons, okay? And so uh, this concept of the ends, ways, and means, but if you noticed, there was a slight hint, uh, more than that, of where we ought to focus, and that if you go back, let's go back two slides here, okay, uh, is, is, is the concept we spent a lot of time on the Joint Staff uh, in, in working with policy is one of our, one of our issues was, was, you know, global health engagement uh, has a pretty full spectrum, mill to mill, mill to sieve, sieve to sieve. And so, what we were finding in, in getting the feedback from the combatant command surgeons, um, you know, was number one is we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money. And so the answer is, okay, we got that. So maybe we need to change what we do, uh, not the amount of money we give you to do what you think you can do. And so that was the focus of saying, okay, if we don't have a lot of money, we have a limited amount of bandwidth, what do we need to focus on? And so if you saw this brief, it was the focus was, what can we do that others can't do, and that's the mill to mill piece of it, okay? Not saying that we shouldn't do mill to sieve, but in the priority of things with the resources we have, and all the lessons learned from all those things that you have read, and you have read, and you have read, is the Department of State's coming out and said, quit getting in our business, and quit doing duplicative efforts, is what formed this. So, uh, I don't know how much you guys have talked about this amongst yourselves, but I'd be interested in seeing some feedback about the validity of, again, not one size fits all, but the focus uh, of the resources that we have and our doctrine saying we ought to be doing mill to mill first, mill to sieve as needed, and then mill uh, disaster response as requested. So I'm going to kind of open it up to, the, to our ultimate customers, the COCOM surgeons. Sir, I'll, I'll make the first comment okay. from Southcom. Uh, again, Rudy Catchwell, uh, Southcom surgeon. Um, we, we do try to take an uh, interagency whole government approach as we engage our partner nations in capability and capacity building. Um, but in reality, in, in many of the nations in my AOR, it is really only DOD that is engaging in health development. Um, USID uh, is constrained. Um, a lot of our USAID folks are focused more on economic development. Um, unless it's at a specific agenda of the ambassador, healthcare, uh, Department of State really is not in involved, and uh, our regional CDCs can only get to so many places. So for us and many of our, my partner nations, DOD is the only one that is engaging in any sort of uh, health engagement. Now, I, I think that's, that's, that's interesting because, you know, that, 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 may, that may be true, but then you still can prioritize what you do. And, and what is interesting, if you look in the upper right, and, and it may not have been uh, real apparent, but that leavening effect of mill on society, you can actually backdoor mill to mill through mill to sieve. Or you can have, or you can front door using mill to mill to get to mill to sieve. And, and that's uh, and that one of the classic examples of, especially in an underdeveloped nation, is if you discipline the soldiers, okay, or what I call the stability force, okay, and basic hygiene, basic this, basic that, then they go back into their communities where that is not the common way to do business, and you would hope over time you may influence the nation, the mill, the sieve piece of it, through the mill-to-mill -mill transference. In other words, you, 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 you uh, train the mission, but then you got, you know, a whole lifetime of experience. The other thing I would also comment too, sir, is many times when you go into the partner nation, MOH your presence, the DOD presence in that partner nation is the first time those two ministries are right. actually sitting together at the same table. Yeah. So, you know, pushing the interagency approach in the partner nation is, is a challenge. Um, and we have a game with MOD, 
energizes the MOH part of that nation, and you're right, exactly, back doing it or front doing it, either way you want to look at it. So. Right. Okay, from PACOM, PACOM perspective, one, I, I, I appreciate and applaud your effort that you're doing here at the policy level. That helps us as your execution arm uh, for global health engagement. So some of the, uh, so our approach at PACOM is, is my approach is a, um, you know, we're a piece of the entire whole of government interagency approach. That's, that's my uh, first message when I meet with the U.S. Ambassador of all the different countries that I go to, is I meet with him or her first. And I say, I, I'm coming here uh, to be part of your team you know, with your interagency partners. Next uh, meeting I have is with the embassy's country, uh, health, country health team. And I deliver the same message. So I'm trying to take a you know, inter interagency approach. DOD is part of the interagency. And that we are going to work with them. And that gets over the, uh, the problem that you, you articulated about uh, you know, uh, we're, we're doing, trying to do everything. So we're just trying to do the things that, that we can do, offer to the ambassador of the country team. And clearly, yes, we do the mill-to-mill -mill piece. Uh, at times, we are asked to assist with the mill-to-sieve piece, and we'll do that. And uh, I have been asked several times to, can you get the Ministry of Defense to work with the Ministry of Health? And I take that on. We're doing that. And, and we're, we're getting some success. So, and then the other piece, so that because um, you know, we all have in our different COCONs, you know, numerous countries, and every country wants us to do something, but because of, of, of resource constraints in terms of money and people, we can't do it all. So I just recently had a strategic offsite with my team and, and start with a starting point of the uh, 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 PACOM commander's priorities and his strategic plan is how can we fit our uh, PACOM J07 uh, priorities and our strategic plan to mit, uh, fit with that. And then we rack and stack our countries in terms of what are our priority countries based on the COCOM commander's priorities, because so, we can't do it all. Right. And I think what's important is, is um, I, I've been hanging out in this world for quite a while, uh, is that I, I almost think that we're there, this room is, in this mill to mill, mill to sieve, as, as, as necessary and then, and then as requested. Uh, but I don't think we still have many of our line guys that have been brought up in the old world of, you know, what, you know, what, what's, what benefits them as opposed to what benefits the nation. And I think, you know, us, us adopting doctrinally and getting this written down, because if you don't get this written down about the prioritization of the mill to mill with the resources, you know, because, you know, the line guy is going to say, says who, and then, you know, so that's why that's so important so that, so that we can continue to educate the guys who ultimately ask us to be a tool in their toolbox. Matt. Sure. Uh, again, just echoing a lot of what's already been shared, uh, both from the stage as well as from my counterparts. You know, Mill Mill is where we certainly focus our efforts, and that is absolutely where we need to, you know, live primarily, but not exclusively, Correct. as has been discussed. Uh, and, and that's, you know, winds up being by country specific because oftentimes due to the, the structure of the governances and the roles of the militaries within individual nations, there may be a division of labor whereby something that we do that is very organic to our Department of Defense in a health-related role does not exist. That is beyond the scope of what their own military does, yet it is important to, to their national security and their national defense, but it is done by another ministry. It's just the way they're organized. And those are really the areas where we wind up spending most of our time then getting ourselves working cross-ministerially. And then there are those that are a little bit more like us, but in areas like biosurveillance where issues are going to span the whole of government uh, to begin with, and we try and build some of those bridges as well. Uh, again, sometimes difficult. Sometimes there is animosity to that between the ministers on, on the side of the host nation. Sometimes there are opinions and positions within our own State Department right. as to what DOD's role should be in terms of uh, helping and stepping across with some of those other ministerials. So you have to take what you get as you go in there because as you said, we are supportive of the ambassador or the chief of mission in that country. And again, we are also working ourselves through our own J-5 uh, and making sure that we're integrated with our commands efforts uh, and as part of that. So again, I, th I think the focus of where we're going with this is right. I think again, the acknowledgement that one size fits all is, uh, is a great recognition as we talked about yesterday in the briefing, this is a, there are a couple dimensions 
to medical security cooperation and from building partnerships on one extreme to internet operability on the other and building partner, building partner capacity which sits really in the middle part of that spectrum, each and every one of those is its own valid endpoint. One can lead to the other in a given capability, in a given location that you can progress to over time, but again, not necessarily so. You know, building partner, building that partnership in and of itself may lead to a other non-medical objective in support of our commander's objectives or our national objectives, and that's fine. And, and, and that measure of performance, that measure of effectiveness may have nothing to do with a medical outcome. It has to do with those secondary outcomes. And again, building the partner capacity may be, in and of itself, as far down that spectrum as we go as an endpoint and recognizing that. And only in those highest order of, of engagement will we ever maybe get to interoperability. So again, it doesn't have to linearly connect, nor should we expect it to in every location and in every dimension of our engagement activity. Um, so again, I think where you guys are going with your thinking on this uh, and adding some rigor uh, to what those measures of effectiveness will be are going to be very helpful to us in the future. General Rob, I'd like to absolutely I'd like to touch on your last point, sir, about how we how do we discipline ourselves to focus primarily on mill to mill? How do we uh, answer to it to our taxpayers about being fiscally responsible with the charge that we're given, mm -hmm. and answer to it, which this is critically important to our, our line commanders who control the purse strings and are, are charged with the, the theater security. Uh, in each of their AORs. One of the things we've been doing in the Air Force as an institution, at least at the component level over the last year, is every two months we brief our Surgeon General, Lieutenant General Travis uh, at a secure VTC. And um, each of the combatant commands are responsible to brief him on uh, within each, each of their AOR, identified their theater campaign plan, identified priority countries, and, and they're held responsible for having at least one medical line of engagement in each of those TCP identified priority countries and develop a line of engagement that they can directly, more than just plausibly, but definitively tie back to in-state objectives for that line commander. So that General Travis, with that information in hand, can turn it back around to the line and say, this is what we've done for you lately, and this is, this is what it's, uh, this is how we're being responsible. And then to hold them accountable, we asked them to develop five-year roadmaps, and this is, again, a bit of a challenge with year of execution funding, which, sure. which is, oh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, these, dominates, do, issues, dominates yeah. the scene, <laughs> but hold them accountable, understanding that, that there will be shortfalls to a five-year roadmap to meet those, those, uh, those uh, goals so they can incrementally and deliberately build capacity and discipline themselves from uh, being drawn into a bunch of one-offs, right. which don't necessarily contribute to a greater end state. So I think that's been very, very useful for us as, as the Air Force in the last year. And yeah, and I, I think that's key, and that's, you know, as, as we mature in understanding a common, and I'm like, Colonel Hastings, jump in here, because at the end of the day, she's the one responsible for making sure that doctrine happens, so. And I would just, <laughs> I want to add to Colonel uh, Chambers' comments on this, boss. Uh, resourcing is incredibly important. I think if we look back at our own history uh, as an MHS, some of the missteps we've taken over the last decade is, how we have resourced some of our health engagement activities. A lot of what we were doing as recently as five years ago, at least within our own service, was using DHP dollars. Okay. Um, and a deficiency act, actually, against the law. Some people may argue against that as well, training, and, and we can use that if and, and nuance our way through it. Okay. Whether we can or cannot, okay, we shouldn't because it actually made us less effective when we did that. The perception as a community of what we were doing in health engagement was, well, that's the medical guys. They're doing their own thing. They're over here. They've got their own money. Uh, they're doing God's work. It's all good. Go after it. Okay. We were not, by not being tied to the resourcing issues, appropriately, legally, but appropriately, it forced us to be a part of these broader, larger discussions to make sure that we were an enabling asset to those military and national objectives. That put us to the table. The resourcing issues put us to the table to be part of those broader discussions because if your commander has one last next dollar to spend on, on engagement, is he gonna spend it on health or is he gonna spend it on something else? And is he gonna spend it in country X or is he gonna spend it in country Y? 
And if he's going to spend it in health and country Y, is he going to do it for activity Z or activity A? Okay? Our ability to articulate that in a meaningful way has a really, I think, in the last five years, begun to pay significant dividends for us. Absolutely. Kurt, real quick. Um, if I could go back to what Rudy Cachuela was saying, um, you're absolutely right. You, ha you have probably one of the most unique um, COCOMs just because of the, um, the dearth of the USAID, et cetera, um, e though each of the COCOMs is quite unique. But if, if I led anyone to believe that um, we don't talk to the civilians, you know, right there, Colonel Zarnick would uh, be the one to uh, disabuse you of that notion um, because of what he did in Liberia. The, the, many times we are the people that bring very disparate groups um, in different ministries to the table by virtue of the fact that they do want to interact with us and they can see our benefits. So mill to mill is, you know, is going to be where we, we do the bulk of the heavy lifting, but we may do it for their mill. We may bring you know, their other agencies to the table for their mill to make their mill more effective which just helps everybody do the job better. Sometimes you backdoor mail the mail through mail to sit, but you gotta, you gotta be able to have that in your m back of your mind, not just have it happen randomly. Yeah, the, the yes. one prerequisite for this, I think, is, um, and I think everybody in this room, because you've, obviously, a lot of you have done it by the show of hands earlier, is if you can tolerate ambiguity, uh, you'll do well with global health engagement, and right there is, is the king of ambiguity. Standing right now. <laughs> uh, well, with that, boy, I'm not sure how I can follow that. Thanks, Pat. Um, a couple thoughts here. First and foremost, General Rob, I do want to make a follow-on comment to your statement about uh, seeing so much blue on that slide there before. You're right. This is the first time for me to AMSIS, and now I know what it is to live among the bourgeoisie, and now I know where all the blue does live because I don't see him down on the dark continent. There I'll just let's like say that. that. Okay, so um, you like that, huh? Okay. So a, a couple of thoughts. Let me give you a different perspective of theater security cooperation from a health engagement standpoint and, and what we do at the ASCC level, not at the folks who talk about it and write the policy, but actually the people who execute it. I've got a TDA, an MTO staff of eight people, actually functional of nine, counting myself, who, who is the uh, U.S. Army Africa Command Surgeon, which is no which is not authorized nor required. Just have you embrace that for a second. We planned 62 engagements last year on the continent among the nine of us. We executed 47. Not one of the funding source that we used was DHP dollars. In fact, all the money that I spend to do this are O&M dollars out of my commander's budget because he understands the value of them, okay? The way that we do engagements is uh, medical readiness training exercises. We don't do med caps. Med caps are failures. Let's just be very straight and forward. Med caps are destructive. Unless you're doing an HADR, uh, they are destructive. Medical readiness training exercises should not be an extension of graduate medical education. Just because you go down to a continent and conduct 40 cleft palate surgeries, you are not doing anything sustainable to the country all are you doing is going to a target-rich environment for your uh, plastic surgeon so they can get their cases required to sit for the boards. It takes a whole lot of money to bring all that equipment down there. The way that we do medical readiness training exercises, and the, I'll tell you the focus for this is because it's about the line commander. We're, our intent is to train. This is Title 10. First and foremost, this is about U.S. security. We don't go to the continent, to any one of them, for the well-being of that continent. We engage because of U.S. security reasons. So the reason that we go down, and I bring medical professionals, is there is no place for us in CONUS to train our medical professionals to work in an austere environment in an expeditionary mindset. So when we send them to the continent, they go down with no class, class 8 whatsoever, only PPE and they work shoulder to shoulder with their surgeons, their anesthetists, their nurses and medics. And they work as a chief resident status. So in terms of uh, what can be done and wouldn't, wouldn't be done, it's only that host nation physician that makes the final decision. We send them down there for training and we get more training than they get training out of it. 
we have lost the art of diagnostics in the clinical setting, right? Most of our subspecialists don't even carry a stethoscope anymore. When's the last time you saw an orthopedist in training carrying a stethoscope? We depend on ultrasound x-ray. When we go down someplace, our folks really get to learn those things. So what I would offer to you up front is I think your focus is a little bit off vector. The focus is about us, not them. The focus is about training of us so that we can respond when the nation calls us to respond and that we don't send our providers there for the first time and they don't know what to do. Without a doubt, it is in our national security to make that nation more stable because we don't have to send people. But first and foremost, this is about us, not them. And if you just take down people and not equipment, ideas are sustainable. Roles and how you interact with patients, so a role model is sustainable, but the equipment is not. So at least I know now who to engage with on these issues because I talked with George uh, Goodwin once about this on a phone and then got lost, and I would be very interested in being part of your work. Thanks. So, and I think what you're also talking about, and, and, and all, everything you say is valid, okay, but also depends on where you stand, all right? Now, it is all about us, okay, not us medics, but it's about, you know, the fact, theater, security, engagement. It's about creating a secure environment in a nation that is, in our, in our, in our, way of looking at it, we feel needs to be secure for the stability of the world and then hence the stability supporting the United States. So, so in, a, in, a, in a strategic sense, what you said is correct. What you also said, and, and, and actually you got me thinking now because, in fact, as a first, so actually all, in fact, all, all the COCOMs, each one of you, you gave a perspective of this block right here, okay? So in other words, to be able to go work in an austere environment so that you go back to the rules that you talked about, that you, that you all talked about, that you don't create something that's not sustainable on a response, I, I think that's where the training is, okay? But at the same time, the bleed over of that is also, they're going to learn something from us, which then creates, a, again, where it's going to be a mel to mel or mel to sieb, okay, engagement. And so we're saying the same thing. But 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 I but what I like is I like your focus about about you know med reds are gone. In fact, in fact, ten years ago in this room, okay, it is almost the default now is 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 a readiness exercise over a a uh, a you know kind of going down there and delivering care. Okay, that that's we're not even debating that anymore. We still have some leftovers, and these guys live it, and you guys live it when you walk in and sit with the fives. You know, some of them are still living in the old world. And that's, and I think just being around as long as I have, the 10 years, and just the tone and the subject, verb, object have been reversed in this room is incredible. But what I would like to use your concept is to further develop, again, the way we can, again, become more efficient and effective in each one of these blocks, because each one of you gave a perspective, depending when you're in the green circle or whether you're in the pink circle, or whatever color that is, or in the yellow circle. So thanks, yep. thanks. And, and sir, I would just do a follow-up with regard to uh, DHA money. So we use our O&M money to fly the personnel down. We then can use HA money, HTA money, and when we, if we buy any Class 8 for this experience, it is only Class 8 or materials that are available in the country, yes. not from outside whatsoever. A larger piece of this is we regularly sit down with USAID and the embassy. And so just a quick example of what we did with a vet training mission. In South Sudan, we went down and uh, started training some of their uh, soldiers to be medics first as part of a, a TCCC type concept, basic lifesaver. We then took the top 10% of them and trained them to be vet techs. And then we taught them how to administer vaccines because we sat down with the Minister of Animals, Wildlife and Fisheries and said, what is most important in your country? And then we sat down with him and the, U the OSC chief uh, and the USAID chief and the NBC and said, 
look, USAID has got a stream that can provide you and pay for these vaccines every year. You don't need us. Minister of Health or Wildlife Fisheries, you need to know this. And so the culmination of our exercise was the minister requested through OSC to USAID the funds and the vaccines. They were delivered. They were delivered through a cold chain maintained by the South Sudanese and the South Sudanese vet techs that we trained went out and veteran, uh, uh, immunized animals. The, that was the uh, last of four engagements to make that happen. That was no kidding sustainable, except for the day after my vet team left is when the Civil War broke out. So you just see the importance of the stabilizing factor of medicine in the country. We left the Civil War. Hey, good. Hey, good. Just sort of, I, I would agree with Jim that there is definitely a us as a, a service requirement to use the COCOM environment to hone our readiness yes. skills. But for me as a command surgeon, my us is a four star, and my us is a theater security campaign plan that I must support. Right. But you must also shape that service's appetite. In other words, uh, readiness to meet your ends, ways, and means for your theater, not the services, and not necessarily the components. Correct? Yes. Yes. Towards the theater security cooperation plan yes. at yeah. the TSP. Yeah. And if, if yeah. we, again, I acknowledge that the services have requirements to train, but at the end of the day, from a COCOM perspective, it is the boss. But if you're going to come into your neighborhood, you're going to train on the things that you need done in your neighborhood, not necessarily what you want to do. Yeah. Oh, got it. And if that's the case, you go shop to another COCOM, right? That's right. I got it. Been there, done it, got that T-shirt. So I, I know we had some comments up here. No? Go ahead. Sir, I've got a question for you, though. As we define mill-mill as our major focus, we, the DOD writ large, though, are still nested under the USG vision writ large. So as, uh, as Jim was saying, working with that embassy team, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a global health uh, uh, background and the non-mill parts of the global health, be it the uh, maintenance of the food supply, uh, diarrhea, illness, malaria, mm -hmm. those are major uh, source of instability in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be careful as we craft this policy that's gonna go forward, if we narrow ourselves. We're not narrowing, you notice that we're not narrowing, we're just saying if I got a dollar to spend, okay, you know, where am I gonna spend? And, and, and that's why it's, it's, it's still a three ship mission here, okay? But, but you, can't, you can't allow, uh, you know, you've got to make a decision to commit. For, and we've got to hold USAID accountable for what they're going to do. We can only do so much. I, I mean, I've, I've been watching this now for 10 years. I've been hanging around a bunch of smart people. They're the ones that are shaping this. They're saying, look, we can't, we can't sit there and, and do this thin layer across the board and get nothing. We've got to decide what the heck we can do, what we do well, focus on that. We're not saying, again, these aren't areas under the curve, by the way. And they're not necessary. You may go to a certain COCOM, or there may be a certain period of time in a COCOM's history where that pink one is bigger than the green one. But in general, as you prioritize, organize, train, and equip to do what you need to do, you've got to have a mission set, or you're not going to be good in anything. You're not going to be good in anything. Right, I, sir. There's not enough money. Okay. Right, I understand. I understand completely. Yeah. The uh, the challenges that the State Department may say, get out of our job, but at the end of the day, there's no other organization in the entire world that has the capabilities we have to go into austere environments. And so that, where, and I agree with you, we can't fund it all, but at the, uh, at the strategic level, how do we codify something that allows- Notice it says milled and mill. notice it as needed. As needed. Yeah, I, uh, I think your point <laughs> regarding Department of State is particularly salient when telling with, with Jim Zarnix. It's actually good to see you talking about the green and blue. The last time I saw you 10 years ago, we were both at JSOC, and I was the, the blue guy in the green backyard, so, so welcome up to D.C. Um, regarding, uh, regarding some of the things you're talking about with Department of State, uh, we can talk offline, but uh, in the last two months, there have been a lot of trauma surgeons. I, know, I believe you're an ER doc. I, I'm a surgeon. Uh, a lot of folks in DOD and Department of State looking at some, some big gaps and vulnerabilities in sub-Saharan Africa and figuring out if we have a small footprint, soft presence, 
What's the solution set? Do we go into, do we select a, a few centers of excellence such as Kenya and invest and help develop interoperability, or do we really slick the, the grease pads for, or grease the pads for getting in there and getting access? I've got a plan. Absolutely. So I'll connect with those guys right, right after this. Um, talking to, about what's going on in, in Southcom and AFSouth, you know, I talked earlier that, that we've been holding our staff accountable to develop TCP mill to mill engagements for General Travis down in each AOR, including uh, Southcom. For example, just uh, about um, August of last year, we sent down some aeromedical folks and trauma surgeons down to Peru to develop their, uh, their uh, capabilities to combat uh, counterterrorism and, and sea emissions down there. Two months after that, I turned around, I was looking over the mission set that AFSouth was developing, and they were teaching a, an advanced life support for obstetrics course in Belize. So I got on the phone and called our team. I said, what the heck is going on? How is this mill to mill? And it turns out it's exactly what you're talking about. They're DOD, DOS, USCID, um, you, you name it, a lot of organizations that are traditionally committed to development, et cetera, are under-resourced to carry this out. And they asked, because we're having governance issues and gang-related violence in Central America, that to enhance the legitimacy of governance in Belize, uh, that if we could do something to train their municipal health workers, they would improve the face of their government, uh, granted, bring, bring the DOD on down, USCID, Department of State both endorse this, so there is uh, definitely a role for that if it meets the overarching security requirements for that COCOM. But not, it, wasn't, but it wasn't your idea, it was somebody else's idea, and then you were, again, as needed, Check. right? As yes, needed, sir. okay. Right. <laughs> not your idea. <laughs> what else? So key. Somehow I'm not going to figure out how we're going to get an extra hour of CME out of this, by the way. So I'm working on it. That's my task here, okay? <laughs> So Key is working with the combat commanders and understanding what the theater security uh, plans are so that we can sink and nest um, and to ensure that we have identified what the DOD plan is and making sure that we've addressed our, our working with the COCOM commanders and helping to meet some of those needs in the COCOMs. So from a global health perspective, global health engagement perspective, um, that is really key uh, for us, again, working with uh, COCOM commanders through our uh, joint uh, staff to ensure that we are synced in this to, to help you address some of those issues. Well, you know, and, we, and we appreciate that, but when I look at the service records, my expectation of the services is to provide organized training and quick access to the job. And we do that. Right. My, my connective tissue service components back to the COCOM, okay? And some of what you're talking about and what the Air Force talked about doing is talking to the Surgeon General of, hey, we're showing we're meeting these objectives. I go, that's good. Um, and, and obviously you need to be working with your components-led IHS team. And I think in one way or another, you know, Rudy, myself, uh, you know, our job is to, is to integrate, prioritize, and deconflict those things across as we get into this resource constrained environment. So with this global health working group that you guys are doing globally, and we're hosting one of those that is run by my staff or our theater with all of our partners, our components, and some of our interagency partners, uh, well, still DOD partners, but with some of our, like DEMO and DENTRA and those other folks who are such great uh, enablers for us to get some of these things done. And I'm sure Rudy's doing the same kind of thing on, on a, whatever frequency that he does that. So, 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 so Mav, I think what you're telling him is, is, is when he's talking theoretically, when, 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 that, when that, not yours, but because you're in the joint, when that Surgeon General is talking to the components, there ought to be a slide up there, or, or that Surgeon General is saying, and how does that nest or fit into the COCOM Surgeon's support that's going, to, that's going yes, to be, that's yes. Right. And, and that is our process, working yeah. through the ASCC yeah. components, the, the surgeons. Because yeah, they ought to be asked right. the question, how does that, that fit? How does that right. fit supporting bam, bam, or bam? Not that we've ever skipped over this, 
No, I know. That's why That's why we're here we're stomping it. You know, you've been there, I've been there. Well, and that's easy to do because you can just pull it off the Sims because the Sims, you have to say what IMO you are supporting with your event. It, 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 my, my intent in, in talking about and emphasizing General Travis. No, no, we're just. To say that we're Air Force centric is to say that as a, as a responsible steward of those resources. Oh, concur. How, how are we getting that mission done for you? Right, right. but yeah, but then, uh, and again, you, uh, but that needs to be stated and that needs to be in, in, in the PPP, PPT slides too that say, you know, that, that uh, we may think that that is implied, yes, sir. okay, but I don't think we're that mature yet that it is. We're almost there. Okay. Yes. Thanks for bringing it up, Mab. That's good. I've enjoyed uh, listening as to how we can see uh, different sides of the elephant. Uh, in this room, uh, the European view is uh, top left is uh, the established allies, and uh, and you know that well from your co-meds role for, with NATO. The bottom left, uh, the way we sell it is the way we can get an airport for you, a port, or some place where the army can safely be, is this is how medical gets you there. Yeah. Uh, anything else is just window dressing. So when when crap hits fan, when the when the missile goes where it shouldn't, um, how do I get one of those spots? Right. Thank you. Smart defense, interoperability, modular. Connected forces. Play. That's what we're talking. Smart defense. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I tell you what, this is, uh, I've been to a lot of conferences in, uh, in the last day, in the last set of uh, lectures, you know, and then to see everybody, actually, this crowd has actually grown uh, since we started. So uh, we're going to have one more question, and again, only because uh, I, I'm that, these folks will stay as long as you want them to, okay? Remember, I have supporting, supported, okay? Um, and, uh, and again, appreciate everybody's, uh, again, co contributions, and this has been great. And I think it was really been special, and I think for you all is at the end of the day, I got the whole customer, but your customers, your COCOM surgeons, and you had all your geographicals here, and that's actually pretty cool. So one last official question. Thank you, sir. I'm Edwin Burkett. I'm the uh, Director of Global Health uh, Education at the, at the USU, teaching the, um, in the, within the, the master's and doctoral public health degree programs, the global health uh, uh, curriculum. So my question is to, not just to the panel, but primarily actually to the COCOM surgeons and component surgeons is, what's the, and, and, and they talked about capability, they talked about some about educational training, What's the capability that you're looking for from education, um, primarily of, of personnel who come to your staffs, uh, either planners or other staff members, and um, then training that will help you accomplish this better? Because we're looking at, you know, we, we teach a global health concentration, 18 units within a MPH and, the, and so forth, but there's only like you know, four or five people who get that every year. Um, it used to be only two. Now we're up to like four or five, and it's and it's joint. It used to be only two Air Force people a year. Now it's uh, a little bit more joint. But that's the kind of thing that we're helping to teach. And so I'd like to know, well, what what how does that uh, play into your role as uh, improving your staff knowledge of global health and being able to apply it across all these these uh, uh, areas that we were just discussing, whether it's tactical, um, just med ready training whether it's uh, strategic level thought on strategic uh, security cooperation. Thank you. Well, I, I, I tell you, we're, 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 where's my uh, AV support? Get up here. All right, it's right here. Okay, here's the curriculum right here. All right, one of the things you talk about is start talking about the foundational principles, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not, which then, then drives you to thou shalt, will do, and that's talking about fundamentally going into a country and, 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 you know, don't create instability when you were just trying to get a mission set done, you know, and that's, you know, and that's, I think we've got to start teaching that, you know, when you look at the, if you looked at the provisions of care and the recommendations, maybe you all ought to get together, but you can glean from these, from these recommendations some underlying principles that if we Bring the folks up, and you know, because someone said, "Hey, let's go in there and do, you know, 20 cleft palates to do this and do that," because it makes you feel not because it makes you feel good, but you look at, hey, actually, there's a tail to that that may be more disruptive, or you don't displace the locals. 
You know, you only go to certain. Those are the kind of things that I think that we need to work in the curriculums, especially at your house, because right. you, you guys are now the keeper of the scrolls. And, and sir, you know, I was on that committee, so I, I like helped write those. And so that's already in our curriculum. Start writing the curriculum. So I'm already, we're all, that's already in the curriculum. Okay. I, I'm kind of getting that. What else are we missing? I think you ought to bring like these co surgeons in as guest lecturers occasionally, too. You know, operational, you can have an operational medical uh, series, you know, all kind of cool folks you guys could do. How you line up a health engagement strategy in line with a blind strategy. Yep. And then three is uh, planning. They need a certain level of planning acumen to get in, for them to be able to structure this in a meaningful way. As we talked about, exercise away from med res, med case, into more exercise structured activities. Having some level of medical planning or experience and know how. So again, the most interface part of my very small staff for my global health engagement, and conversely, almost everyone else on my staff helps those guys out in various ways. Uh, if we are looking for a bridging strategy to expand upon our health engagement tools with those that we already have on staff, I think an easy win for us is we also need to look into our medical planners. As we are forced developing our medical planners, so is health engagement is probably an area we need to expand their skill and knowledge base is on health engagement. Because they're gonna do, they're really tied to the hips with my my security cooperation program. Okay. For those uh, MSC, you know, uh, the radio security guy, uh, you know, the uh, seven, seven, you know, our 70 hotels in the army. So, but the truth about it is, at least at Southcom, is particularly with the reduction in staffing, my planners are fully occupied with the continued review of existing con plans and O plans and revising Annex Qs. So, yeah. levy global health engagement on that small group, I think, would not be fair. And I'm trying to keep it, well, they're involved, but again, we're parsing it out to the different areas on the staff, and that's why I look to you all. Uh, are we a perfect resource to co-com to do global health engagement? Mm -hmm. So from the standpoint, uh, a couple of concepts. I, I hear a lot about international health specialists. I don't have one on my, uh, on my staff. They don't impact what I do uh, at all. So uh, good in concept, but I don't have one, and I don't see them. Uh, secondly, from a training standpoint, and uh, Best training is done through vignettes of what have worked well and what have not worked well. So putting together a list of vignettes that people can brief to say, this is an example of not only no, but hell no, right? And then this one is good. Uh, the concept of you don't do it in a vacuum. Every time I do an engagement, uh, really my G9 is in the lead. I bring my engineers with me as well. Sometimes I bring commo folks and myself as well. So, and then I tie it, of course, it always with exercises as well, because I'm vetted underneath exercises. And so we tie together all types of money. I think the ability to show how you can put multiple types of money into one engagement using exercise-related construction, using HCA money, you need HCA money, and knowing that you may go back there, that is something that should be taught. The final thing is, uh, it is interesting how the, all the NGOs want won't even talk with us unless we've gone to the course in Geneva to become smart about how they do things. The reality is we at USU should develop a course that the NGOs come to to learn how to work with the DOD because... You be right, are you writing that down? I am writing All right, start <laughs> typing. We, 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 we are the entity which will continually be out there. They have the 50-year plan. We come in in the one-year plan. It, and it's not like we can forget about each other. We just have to figure it out. Uh, I will tell you, this is the first time uh, it, the issue in Liberia just made it very clear. Remember, the DART team went to Liberia, and they come down with a big bag of money. And the way that they work is they don't have any contracting folks with them. 
they work all through grants. And the presumption is they'll go down and they'll give NGOs money to take care of projects. But in Liberia and in Guinea and Sierra Leone, all the NGOs left because they were dying. So it was a square peg in a round hole. They went down and there was no money or there was no NGOs to execute. It was MSF for the first time in their history that asked US military to come in and help. They were more than willing to sit down at the table with us and talk about review of ETUs, et cetera. We have got to build off of this right now because the, the NGO community, at least down in Liberia right now, have seen a very different view of the military than they've seen in the past, and they like it. Yeah. Hey, Jim, I want to certainly compliment on that comment. I think you're, you're spot on. I have about a dozen books in, in my office about humanitarian uh, development and efficacious, et cetera, all written by heads of NGOs, and they pay lip service put it kindly to the DOD, but none of them have invited the DOD to contribute to one of those chapters. So one of the things we're doing in, in this upcoming fiscal year is we're um, publishing a book on global health and disaster medicine, and we've reached out to a number of different NGOs, uh, and they'll be contributing on how to do nation or, uh, capacity building exercises, uh, both in the phase zero environment, and also in reconstruction environment, and also in responding with the DOD to complex humanitarian disasters. Yeah. So, and, and, and I, I, I'm going to kind of sort of bring this to closure because because I, I, I'm getting this, hey, we're paying overtime for this room or something. <laughs> but but uh, your comment about, I don't want to say we're the last holdout, but again, I've been tracking this for almost two decades now. Two decades ago, none of the NGOs would be sitting down and talking to us, okay? None of them. And then, then there were three or four sentinel events that occurred, uh, you know, um, when I, when I, 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 I kind of look back on where we gained the trust, but that's because we actually learned from our mistakes, okay? From the, what I call the decades of the 70s and the 80s and probably mid, the mid 90s. One was, it was already mentioned, was the typhoon, okay, in, in Indonesia. And the fact that we walked in, Admiral said, we are supporting, this is your ship. It was a neutral place. And, it, and, and all of a sudden, it was just a simple act. Okay, the second one that happened was major, okay, was the earthquake relief in Pakistan. And, okay, and there was a combination. We were on the back end of that, okay, but it was the Pakistani military that led the most of the response to that. And we kind of, we brought in the, the stuff, and that was called Diplomacy by Chinook. <laughs> Diplomacy by Chinook. And again, we got most of it right. We did a pretty good job. In fact, I, I tell you this one quick story. When do we know, uh, here's where we failed. We didn't have an exit strategy for the MASH there. But when do we know it was time to go? And the fact that we realized it was, was, was cool. When do we know it was time to go? When the pharmacist, the local pharmacist said, you're killing me. You're killing me. You're cutting, I can't make a living. Now, you know what, the commander says, I got it. Time to go. It was simple, but we would not listen to that before. Then the third one was, if you look down at Haiti, okay, you know, when you look at Haiti, we were act incredibly in support, and we let that council of NGOs and the Minister of Health create the what, kind of what I call the rules of engagement that we all agreed, and that's when we introduced, you know, who was going to go to the ship. It was who was going to go to the ship was ones that could come off the ship. And if you, if you were anticipating you weren't going to come off the ship, then you weren't going to the ship. So in other words, going back to the host nation's capability. So I've watched incrementally over time. And when we do stuff like that, we gain trust. And I would argue with those three events, and, and then again, at the end of the day, the security environment drives what they will do. MNS, that, what I call the Doctors Without Borders, the last holdout finally said, hey, I think, you know, they... Even our donors are going to have to understand this, because that was the issue, by the way. <laughs> okay, so thanks for your input. Thanks for everybody being here. And again, thanks for our presenters.